George Washington is probably the most iconic person in the entire history of the United States, with history classes focusing on his heroics and actions during the Revolutionary War. But it's vastly important to understand what led him to those events. Now here I must mention that George Washington was far from the perfect hero that many history classes portray him as. I recommend watching my previous video, The Battle of Jaumonville Glen, where I discuss a much darker event in his life. Now, the history and story of Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus, better known just as Cincinnatus, represented everything that George Washington wanted to be remembered as, a selfless, hardworking leader that cared for the freedom and rights of those he led. These ideals influenced George Washington and how he lived his life right up until his death in 1779. It's important to note now that modern historians debate the authenticity of the history of Cincinnatus, with some believing that the events were greatly exaggerated or entirely made up. But whether the myth of Cincinnatus is accurate or not cannot be denied that it influenced the citizens of Rome and the founding president George Washington very much greatly. Cincinnatus was believed to have been born around 519 BC in Rome. Born to the Quinica family, a long surviving patrician Roman clan, Cincinnatus grew up in a wealthy household that allowed him to become an educated patrician with a well-off life. Now, the highest elected political position in the Roman Republic was that of consul. Every year, two patrician men would be elected to the position. With themselves being the chairman of the Senate, they had control and power over the military and the civil laws of the Republic in entirety for one year. During 460 BC, the most important issue faced was that of the legal status of the plebeian class brought on by the laws of the Twelve Tables. The legislation was a set of laws that were created to recognize and fix the social struggles between the plebeians and the ruling patrician elite. The plebeian tribune Tarantillus Arsa called for the laws to be written down to prevent the consuls and other members of the senate from applying them arbitrarily. These demands caused great disturbances between the two classes, with Cincinnatus taking the side of the patricians. While he went against the plebeians gaining more legal power, he didn't make any aggravated attempts to prevent it. The same can't be said about his son, Seiso. Seiso was known to take physical action in attempts to dissuade plebeians from supporting these laws. Several allegations were made against Seiso, probably many more that we don't know about, but there was enough evidence that Seiso was convicted and sentenced to death. But Cincinnatus was able to pay a heavy fine to save his son but it did financially ruin him. This won't be the last we hear from Seiso, as in the very same year, a group of plebeians and slaves would attack and take control of the capital. During this fighting, both Seiso and the consul Publius Valerius Poplicola would be killed. In 460 BC, at the age of 59, Cincinnatus then would become the replacement of the Roman consul following Publius's death. For the remainder of the year of Cincinnatus' consulship, he would continue to fight against the plebeians, but he didn't make much progress. Following the end of his tenure, with little money left and his family name tainted by his son, Cincinnatus would retire to a small farm he owned on the edge of the Tiber River. With these issues of social inequality raging throughout Rome, they faced an increasingly dire situation beyond its borders. In 458 BC, Rome was finding themselves being constantly assaulted from their neighbors, the Volsci, Equi, and the Sabines. Rome would send an army led by consul Lucius Minucius to defeat the invading tribes. The major turning point would be when he and his army would get trapped in the Alban Hills on the Algidus Mountain. Realizing that the situation was growing worse and worse, the consul who remained in Rome, Gaius Nadius, and the Senate decided to appoint a dictator to handle the situation. In the Roman Republic, someone could be elected dictator in an extreme military crisis in which they would be given six months of complete power over the Republic to do what they deemed necessary for it. Cincinnatus was unanimously chosen to become dictator, with the historical records by Livy describing a council of Romans traveling to Cincinnatus' farm on the edge of the Tiber where they begged him to help as he plowed one of his fields. 
Cincinnatus's first focus as dictator was to bring support to the trapped Minucius and his men on the Algidus. Cincinnatus and Munucius would launch a double-pronged attack on the Equi army, where they would be able to come out victorious. Cincinnatus, in a moment of kindness, wouldn't murder the captured Equi. Instead, he would let them live as long as they returned to their land and officially declare defeat against Rome. Cincinnatus would also revoke Minucius's title of consul, ordering him to, quote, you will command these legions as a staff officer until you begin to show the spirit of a consul." End quote. Following this, Cincinnatus moved quickly and efficiently through the ranks of the raiding tribes, forcing the other tribes to surrender just like the Equi. With the end of the war, Cincinnatus would disband his large army, and the most important fact is, he would resign from his position as dictator, the most powerful position in the Republic, only 15 days into a six-month term. He relinquished his position because of his selfless service to Rome, as well as his lack of personal ambition and power hungriness. He was happy to leave leadership and return to farming his small land next to the Tiber. This attitude would be mirrored in the future by George Washington. George Washington was viewed just like Cincinnati as a selfless man who only wanted the best for their countrymen. While some debate if either man was truly like this, or if it was a twisted to this view of righteousness to make their legend greater than it really was, what we do know is that the myth of Cincinnatus greatly influenced George Washington, and that he himself has greatly influenced the modern America.